Hey, everybody. So in this lesson in Adobe After Effects, we are going to start talking about tracking and stabilization. And I find that tracking and stabilization are really fundamental to a lot of the work you do in visual effects. I never used to appreciate it as much as I do now, but the more and more I do visual effects work, the more I see that tracking is so important to putting, you know, characters or 3D animation or whatever it may be into scenes and making it feel like it's really there. Uh, it's all about tracking and stabilization. So we're going to work with some of the basic track and stabilization controls inside of After Effects, and then we might jump into some other programs and look at how tracking is done inside of there. So we're going to go here to the windows, and we're going to bring up the tracker window. And the tracker window is usually right here in the corner. It's really small there in the corner, and you see some tracking controls. Um, but I'm just going to take it and move it up here to the side. I really like seeing it up here where it's nice and big and I have a little bit more control there. And I'm gonna start with this scene of Freehold Street. So we're gonna look at this Freehold Street and we're gonna work with some basic ideas of stabilization. So if we look at this footage here, I just made a composition the same as this video. This is a uh, 11 second video of this. Um, and you can see that it's shaky. It's very shaky inside of here. Camera's moving around. It's rotating a little bit. So the camera's rotating and you can tell the camera's rotating because everything in the scene is rotating. It's not like the tree is rotating. It's like everything in the scene is rotating. And it's a little bit shaky up and down and left and right. And we want to kind of stabilize this. Now we're going to start with some basic kind of old fashioned ways of stabilizing. This might not be necessary with the new stabilization controls that are inside of After Effects. And this might be kind of a little bit historic more than, you know, immediate, but we're going to work with some basic ideas of stabilization. So I'm going to go in here and there's a control up here that says stabilize motion. And we're going to choose stabilize motion. What that's going to do is it's going to open up another layer window of this video that we're clicked on. So we click on a video and then we can stabilize motion here and it opens this up here. And inside of here, it shows this track point right here. And if you look at this track point, the track point consists of an outer box that looks like this and then an inner box and then a little crosshair right there. And so this outer box right here is almost referred to as the search area. And this inner box is referred to as the region of interest. And so the region of interest looks like this. This is what we're gonna look for. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this, this tracker here, track point one here. We're gonna use this track one to stabilize. It says use current track, use tracker one to stabilize, and we're gonna use that as our stabilization control. Now, how do we do this? Well, we tell this system that we want to say, find a point, find a point that's really noteworthy. That's really interesting. Now, how do we find a point that's interesting? Well, we look for something that has a high contrast pattern. In here, in the tracker controls, you will see that there's options here. And in the options, it says, look for tracker based on luminance. So we're looking for contrast. We're looking for light and dark. And so we want something that's either really dark against a light background or really light against a dark background. We want something there. Now we could say, let's use this corner here. Um, that might be a place to go. We could even use this big X in the middle of the screen here, this giant X for the railroad crossing. We could use that. But the problem with that is, is we can watch, there's gonna be cars driving over this. And so we're not gonna have the X perfectly well. Now, what I like is I found this point over here. We want something that's going to be on screen the whole time, that's going to be mostly there and is not going to move. We want something that's not going to be locked down. We want to stabilize and track to the front of this car because the front of this car moves. So we're going to go here and I'm going to drag over here. And we see when it drags over, it actually zooms in really close. And I like going over to this corner right here to the end of this curb here. We're going to go right to this, this little corner of the curb. So this is the curb, the light curb, the yellow curb, and the corner, the little break between the curb there. I'm going to go right there. So what I'm telling the system is I want to find something that looks like this. And I want to find something that looks like this. And I want to lock on to something that looks like this. So I want to make sure that here, whatever this is, it locks on there. Let's go back to the beginning of this because you can see that obviously this doesn't stay locked on. When we go back to the beginning of it, oh, my thing is all the way over there. Look at that. That's not cool. So we'll go here and we'll say just lock on. To this. So we're going to make sure to keep this part in the same exact place the whole time. And so we're looking at this region of interest. This is the place that we're going to look for. This is the place that the software is going to look for to examine that we're in the same right place. Now, the way we're going to do that is we're going to look within the search area. Now, some people think, well, why don't I make the search area nice and huge? I can check the whole image. Well, that might get confusing because the search area might say, hey, over here, there's some curb. Over here, there's some curb. Which curb am I looking for? No, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't need a search area that big. I just need a search area big enough that says, hey, let's look for this area within a span. Again, right here. Let's look for a search area that's maybe only 
like this big, just big enough that if it moves now, if it moves outside of that search area, that's fine. It's inside the search area here. But if for some reason it did move the search area, it's okay as long as between each frame, it doesn't move. So if it moved at the next frame to here, this whole box will move to there. And if it stays within the search area at each and every frame, you know, it's it's the distance it travels within the frame. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the, yeah, that's the way to say it. Then we're looking for the distance it travels per frame. And if it's not moving that much, I mean, here it's not moving within this, within the whole 11 seconds, it's still in that search area. But that's not even important. All I just do is make sure it doesn't move more than from here to here or from here to here within between one frame because every frame is going to update the outer box, the search area box there. And so we have this point locked down and we are right now looking to track position. It says track position here. So we are going to say, let's track forward. Now we can go forward one frame at a time if we were nervous, but let's be confident. Let's be arrogant about this. Let's go in here and say, analyze forward. We're going to analyze forward and you're going to see that it's going to start tracking forward and these numbers are going to start moving here and cranking up. And we're going to watch this. We're going to watch this closely and make sure that this box moves with this. So this X is right here at this crosshair right there at every single frame as it moves forward. We're going to let it go. We're going to trust it. Now, if we were really confident, maybe we'd take a break. We'd leave the room. We'd go get a cup of coffee. We'd come back. It would be tracked beautifully. Maybe it'd be wonderful. Maybe we'd have the best track in the whole world. I don't think I'm that confident. I think I'm going to watch this. Does a watched track never track? I don't know. I, I just... I obsess over this. What I used to do is I used to obsess over this and keep my finger kind of right here the whole time. And I would do that in case that God forbid you might see this track jump to over here or jump over to here, or do something crazy. If it did, you could just stop your track, reposition yourself, and then start your track again. And so you could fix the track. But again, this is tracking forward. We're about uh, one and a half seconds here. We're going to let this track for a little bit longer. A lot of this lesson today is going to be a lot of kind of sit and wait for something to do something because the software is just doing it. It's just tracking itself and it's just making it work. We'll go for about four or five seconds here. We're just going to let this track forward. And you'll see as it tracks, this box will move. And this is what I was talking about before. As this box moves, it moves with it. So as long as it doesn't move more than this distance or this distance or this distance or this distance, it doesn't move inside this box per frame. The frame always updates the search area to be around the point. And so relatively easy. When it's done, when it's done tracking, we are going to say stabilize. So we're choosing track stabilize, and we're going to stabilize position here. So we're at three and a half seconds right now, and we're just going to let this track maybe to four and a half. We'll go a little bit further just for fun. And we can just watch this and hope. The tracks have gotten really much better as long as you have a good point, it, the really the trick is to make sure you have a good point to track. So I'm going to go to about four and a half seconds and I'm going to stop there. I think that's going to be good enough for us uh, just to get a sense of how this thing is tracking. Now, what it's going to do is going to say, OK, this point, I'm going to use this point and I'm going to lock this point down. We're a little over four and a half seconds here. We're going to hit stop. I'm actually going to move my work area end just to be here, just to show you this four and a half seconds. Could I do the full 11 seconds? Yeah, but that would be a kind of a boring lesson. So now what we're going to do here is we're going to say, okay, let's apply this. So it says apply this here, and we're going to say apply this. And it's going to ask us a question. Do we want to apply it to the X dimensions and the Y dimensions, or do we want to apply it just the X only or just the Y only? Well, in this case, if we had something that was like, say, moving left and right on purpose, but it was jiggling up and down, we'd want to just apply it to the Y dimensions or if it was vice versa there. But I think in this case, we want to lock everything down. We're going to apply it to the X and Y dimensions and say, okay. And then we'll put all these points here. It put a point on the confidence and the attach point and it moved the transform controls. It put something on the anchor point. And what it basically does here is if you go back to the beginning here, I'm going to bring up the rulers. Command R, bring up the rulers here and I'll show you. So this point right here, it decides sort of kind of that this is a point right here where this is perfectly needs to stay locked down. Now, how does it lock down? Well, it offsets frame by frame the anchor point. So it made keyframes for the anchor point to move this so that this always stays. So it kind of offsets, it shifts this across the anchor point so that this moves. Now, one of the problems is, is you'll get this kind of black area around here or this checkerboard area here, if you want the checkerboard, and you have some problems here because in order for this to stay in the same place, it had to move the whole image 
so that this place is locked down. Well, how do we solve this? Well, we solve this by scaling up. We decide that here we figure out where it's where it's worse. And we say, hey, let's scale up here. We'll scale up kind of to there. The position is kind of left alone. So we can even say, let's move the position over a little bit. And here, now, as long as it doesn't lose drift out of the black space there, so we're going to say right here, it's there, it's in the frame the entire time. This line, and you're going to see that this point that we made right here and here, right where this is, this point right there is never going to move. Now, does it look great? Does it look stable? No, but it's that point is not moving there. And the other reason why it doesn't look stable here, it looks kind of stable, but the other reason why it doesn't look really stable here is because um, it is rotating. So the camera is rotating a little bit. The camera is rotating. And we know that because we can see the whole scene rotating. It's not like one thing is rotating. The whole scene is rotating. But man, this, look at this right here. This line is staying right there. This is locked down. It's offsetting it there. You want to figure out what the least amount of scale up you can do is. So maybe 115, if we went to like 110, would it drift out of the frame? No, it's actually holding on. So 110 is not that bad. Like, oh, no, we lost it. We lost it there. Could we could we push this over a little bit and just make up the difference? Just so it's there. And so would that be enough that it stayed in the frame? It stayed in the frame, but didn't show any area here, but was scaled up minimally. We don't want to scale up like 200%. That'd be crazy. It'd look all blotchy and pixelated. We want to scale up just enough so that it holds there. But let's do this again. I know we're going to do this all over again. I'm going to delete this here. We're going to bring Freehold Street back down into this thing, and we're going to do this again. Except this time, we're going to say stabilized motion based on position, but then also based on rotation. So we can do position and we can do rotation and scale. Now, anytime we do rotation and scale, it's going to create a second track point. So let me show you this to you. If we do just based on position here, we'll just undo here. Um, we're going to start here on position. And if we do position, we can put position here. In order to determine position, we need one point. It's only required in, is one point to maintain position and let us know position is in the right place. In order to look at rotation scale, we need to look at the whole image, which means we need a secondary point to look at. So when we hit rotation, it creates a track point too. In this case, I'm going to use this corner over here. Another point of really defined interest. I like this little shape right here, the top of this uh, sign here, signpost. Um, so this point right here, we're going to put this right there, right in the middle of there. And we're going to say, hey, look for this inside of this box. And that's the detail with rotation and scale, because you can tell position just by one point. But in order to tell something's rotating or to tell that the camera's rotating and it's not like this car is rotating or this tree is rotating or a person walking the street on this bicycle is rotating, in order to tell that the camera's rotating, we need to look at two points, a primary point and a secondary point to see that both of them are rotating against each other and we can see how this thing is rotating. So now we're going to track position and rotation. It's kind of a weird idea. Let me, again, back at the beginning of this, let's reset these points. I like to work from the beginning. I feel like from the beginning is a better way to go. We don't need to, but just me being weird. We're going to say we're going to track right there, from that point to there, and we're going to watch this track. I'm going to hit track forward, and we're going to let this thing start to track forward. And we're going to watch two points now. Now I'm going to be really obsessive. It's going to track forward. We're going to watch it track. We may not do a full three, four seconds. Maybe we'll only go to two just to get a sense of how this works. This is basic point stabilization. So basic, simple point stabilization is kind of rudimentary. It's kind of old fashioned. It's not something I would use normally, but honestly, I want to show it to you because sometimes in a pinch, point stabilization is your friend. There are better stabilization controls inside of After Effects for sure, but man, every now and then it's like, go back to the good old fashioned, you know, the abacus, you know, go back to the good old fashioned way of, way of stabilizing, which is basic point stabilization. So I'll just show this to you really quick. This is going to be like two seconds here. We're not going to do much. You'll get the idea. We can make it longer, but we don't want to waste too much time on this tutorial. So we'll go to two, maybe two and a half, just to get a sense here. So now what's going to happen is we're going to go here and I'm going to say stabilize here. We're going to back this up to here. And we're going to apply this again. Apply this to the target. 
It's going to say track on the X and Y dimensions and then say yes. Cool. And then, okay, so it made all these track points here. But now this point, we'll go back to the beginning here. This point is stable and this point is stable. Simultaneously, this point will be stable and this point will be stable. So ultimately, we have a stable image. Now, what did it do? Well, it created a whole bunch of track points and a bunch of features and confidence and how it attached the points. It made a whole bunch of things there. But then it controlled the anchor point, the position, and the rotation. So we are going to take this and look through this here. And again, we're going to probably scale this up. If you have to scale this up, like I would say past 115 or 120, you may have a problem. Looks like 117 here. Again, this is offset here. We could say turn some of this off here. Um, so right here, we have the position control is set there. We're going to turn off the position control. That way we can offset the position and move this kind of more like this. Again, we could probably scale down a little bit. And now you're going to see that we have both scale for anchor point and for rotation. Again, I'll make sure these lines, just so you can have a visual here, is here by here. We did scale up to 115, which is a lot. I wouldn't want to go much further than that. I mean, I think I can get away with like 110, 115. But now this is relatively stable. It's a little shaky, but it's a little, it's definitely more stable. And it's only two seconds, two and a half seconds. So you get what you get. But this is how we could stabilize this image using this level of point stabilization. So we can stabilize this this way. And this is a perfectly fine way to go. Now, that said, we're going to do this one more time. We're going to do this over again, and we're going to do it this way. We're going to go to Freehold Street here, and I'm going to go say, okay, I'm decided that After Effects is smarter than I am. And After Effects, instead of using one point or two points to point stabilize, we can use this thing called Warp Stabilizer. And up here, this thing called Warp Stabilizer. It's in the menu here, in the animation menu under Warp Stabilizer VFX. You can also right-click on a layer and go to Track and Stabilize Warp Stabilizer VFX. So that's the full name of it. It used to be called Warp Stabilizer. Now they're calling it Warp Stabilizer VFX. Oh, sounds amazing. What this is going to do is going to do a special thing. So when you apply this, you see Warp Stabilizer VFX, and now the computer is going to take over itself. It's going to say, hey, I will stabilize this thing. And what it's going to do, it's going to bring up this effect. And this effect over here called Warp Stabilizer is there, and it says initializing. Now, this may take a little bit of time. I understand this is a slow process. And what it's doing right now is it's looking through this entire image. And as it looks through this entire image, it's going to look through this entire image, all 11 seconds here. And it's going to look through this entire image and look for points on its own. It's going to look for everything that it sees as a high contrast point. So it will see this point. It'll see this point. But it'll also see here and maybe this window and then maybe this window. And it'll see everything in here that it can see to stabilize this based on all of these points. It's going to look through all these points and figure out all this stuff and look there. It's going to say initializing for a little bit of time there. And then it's going to start to say analyzing. And as it analyzes, you'll see a number go up. It'll go by frame by frame, and it's doing it all itself. So I'm not even doing anything. It is inventing all of its own points. It is finding all its own points and deciding to stabilize. And so, again, I'm just going to talk for a little bit because it just takes a little bit of time. And I'm really at the mercy of this system to figure out what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to stabilize. Now, this Warp Stabilizer VFX, we can talk about some of this now. It's using a method here called Smooth Motion. And Smooth Motion basically says, hey... When I did this scene, one of the things I did was I stepped off the curb. I actually had an intentional movement. I moved and kind of moved off the curb to there. That's a kind of a big motion, a big broad sort of motion. But also, but also I was a little bit, I don't know, I want to say shaky, shaky. I was jiggly. I was I was moving about with little kind of micro motions there. Well, it keeps the broad motions. It says, hey, you know what? The broad motions. These are fine. Keep the broad motions, but the minimal motions, the little shaky motions, it deciphers the difference between there. And that's in the smoothness amount. You can kind of tweak this and decide more or less smoothness. Again, this is taking some time to just to initialize, to just plot out all these points to figure out what it wants to do for points and how it wants to attribute points within this stabilization here. So we're going to let this work, let it do its job. And there it's going to start to say here, now it's stabilizing 10%. It's this frame 54, 271. Halfway through this, it'll actually say the number of time. 10 seconds left. This is analyze step one of two. So step one of two here says analyzing. It's almost done, 70%. And then it's going to go to stage two, which is going to say stabilizing. This banner is going to go from blue to yellow, orangey. And now it's going to say stabilizing. And now this is what it did. Okay, it did a bunch of things here. The first thing it did was 
it made a bunch of points. And if we go into the advanced controls, I just want to show this to you. It's kind of cool. If we go into the advanced controls, you'll see a thing here that says show track points. And you can turn this on. You can see all the points that it made. And here, if you look and zoom in really closely, you can see that it put a point here and a point here. All these different little different colored X's at various points where it said, hey, I think I can memorize this. I think I know what this looks like. And with these, look at the two railroad things there. Um, man, and I, it memorized all these points and it made like 100 points all over the screen. Well, we're going to turn these points off here and we're going to look at this here. So what did it do? Okay, it did a method called subspace warp. And the way that subspace warp does is it takes this and turns this screen or turns the video clip into basically a piece of fabric. Or what I like to think of is I like to think of a fruit roll-up. You read a fruit roll-up? Yeah, it turns it into basically basically a fruit roll-up. And it says, hey, this fruit roll-up right here, I'm going to take this and I'm going to put all these pins in here. I'm going to take this and pin this down here. Now, fruit roll-ups normally, because they're fruity goodness, they're delicious. Uh, you should have one today. Uh, these fruit roll-ups are stretchy. You know, they're stretchy. They're elastic. They have a little bit of stretchiness here. And it locked all this down based on these points. So if we, again, had the ruler up and we said, hey, let's go here and bring up the rulers. And we had a point here and a point here and a point there and a point everywhere. All these points here, it would lock down every single one of these points. In order to do that, what does it do? Well, it does a little bit of warping here. So it's going to end up doing a little bit of warping of these points here and hold these down there. And so that is kind of part of the equation of what it's basically doing. So we're going to move these out of the way here, and we'll go back to Warp Stabilizer and look at what Warp Stabilizer is doing. So this is doing Warp Stabilizer in here. It's doing subspace warp. So we have this here. And so this Warp Stabilizer right now, it has the points up, so it's not going to do any stabilization. You'll see that it's all grayed out. We're going to turn the track points off. We'll turn them back on a little bit. But for now, we're going to turn the track points off here and say, let's go back to this Stabilize. So it's doing this stabilization. One of the things it's doing here is it's actually saying with the framing, it actually auto-scaled this. So there's an auto-scale feature in here to auto-scale. It actually stabilized this. It cropped up the edges so you don't see the edges moving around when you play through. And it also auto-scaled it up to a 102.7%. It actually figured out that it needs to go up to 102.7% in order to be scaled just enough to keep all this stretchy fruit roll up in here like so. And let's take a look at this. So that natural motion of me stepping off the curb is there, but the shakiness is gone. I mean, it looks, looks pretty darn good. And here's the truth. Nine times out of 10, Warp Stabilizer, it exists in Premiere Pro. It exists in Adobe After Effects. It really is the way to go. It is really fantastic. It's a really nice control to get really nice stabilization. And it does, you know, it allows that little bit of motion. It allows for there. Um, if it's not working, there's some things we can do. So one of the things we can do here is right now it's doing this method called subspace warp. And it's allowing for that smooth motion. Now, if you didn't want that smooth motion, you could say, hey, no motion. Let's just lock down the motion entirely. Let's forget about motion and say, hey, don't move at all. Just have this have no motion. That would probably scale it up a little bit more. It will retract. Um, but we'd like the smooth motion. I think I want the little step off the curb. So we're going to leave it alone. We could also use some of these other methods. I work with some people who don't like subspace warp because sometimes if you have stuff that's moving in a weird way and the shot is really shaky, it'll stretch the, the, the image in a weird way. And you'll see like this tree or this pole bend in a weird way because it's pulling like the top of this pole this way and the bottom of this pole this way. And you'll see some weird, well, I guess warping. It looks warpy. So you can try, say, position or just position scale rotation or just perspective. It will reanalyze. It'll say retracting and restabilizing. And then we'll see how that looks and see if that's better. Sometimes stabilizing just using perspective, which would be just to bend it and turn the image kind of sort of. Does that look better or worse? Well, it's rendering right now, so we can back up and see how this looks. I mean, that's pretty much the same. But if you if you notice any weird kind of warbliness to this image, you may want to not include some of that control. So you can do perspective, you can do position scale rotation. One of the other things you can do is if you see your track points and there are like, for example, track points on this car, what you can do is you can highlight the track points around this car and say, hey, I do not want to track this car here. And I just say, let's delete those points. It'll restabilize. And then it'll restabilize without the car. So if there are things that are intentionally moving in the scene that aren't supposed to be locked down, you could grab those points and say, yeah, I don't want this. I don't want anything on this car. Just delete those points there and say, don't bother tracking those and it will restabilize without those things included.
So if you do see stuff that's in the frame that doesn't stabilize the way you want it to, you could restabilize based on less information. I once did a scene where I was uh, I, I was trying to stabilize. Uh, I had a camera shot of my kids in the backyard on the trampoline. And they were on the trampoline. We have a trampoline in my backyard. And I was trying to stabilize based on that. Uh, and the problem was is that the kids were bouncing the trampoline and it was trying to keep the kids stable even though they were going up and down drastically because they were on a trampoline, of course, and it was using subspace warp and uh, it was a nightmare. My kids got all stretched out and their necks got all weird and long. It was something I never, ever want to see again. It was uh, horrifying. So I, in some cases, when push comes to shove and you know, you're know you shooting a scene of, I don't know, like people at a, at a concert in a mosh pit or something and there's just too much motion going on, good old point stabilization may save you. Um, sometimes warp stabilizers just trying to try to accommodate for too much and it just does too much of a job that isn't there. Like I said, nine times a 10, it's the way to go, but sometimes it's just not necessarily your friend. And so we go back to some fundamental stuff. Anyway, so that is stabilization there, either using stabilized motion or warp stabilizer, but let's go into tracking here. So we're going to go into something different here. We're going to start over and we're going to go to this shot of this bus here. And we're going to talk about some of the basic tracking controls inside of After Effects. So we have this scene of this bus, this New Jersey Transit bus, leaving from where I live, and we decide that we want to get rid of the word New Jersey Transit. We want to just eliminate New Jersey Transit and have it not show up in here. We're just going to have not New Jersey Transit there. So we're going to block New Jersey Transit with something else. We could block it with a blur, I guess, or we could block it with something else as an idea. So let's look at both here. So what we're going to do is we're going to track motion up here. So up here, there's a control for track motion. Again, it's going to open up a layer menu or a layer panel. And here it gives us track points. So we have a track point here and we have this inside of there. And we're going to look for this NJ symbol. So we're going to track this NJ symbol. We're going to say right there and we're going to look for this NJ symbol right inside of this area here. So we're going to look in this box. Again, we don't have to look at the whole bus. We're just going to look in this box here and say, let's just track in that area there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to track forward. Again, single point tracking. We could do a second point tracking with rotation or with scale, um, but I think we're going to be okay here to say track forward. We're going to track this and see what this does. We'll do this for a couple seconds. Let this track forward. It's staying on the NJ right now. You're seeing it's holding right there in the NJ. Right there in the same place every time and it's tracking that NJ. I don't want to make this track too big because it might get confused and see like this over here, that looks like the NJ symbol with the bend down and the whatnot. No, I want to keep the track area relatively small, relatively decent size, just enough so that as this bus moves, it tracks through and holds there. We're going to let this go for a couple seconds. Again, this is going to take some time. It's all tracking lesson, just sitting watching a computer do something. Sometimes it's not the most exciting thing. But it's necessary, you know, if you want to put something cool in some scene and have it look like it belongs there, you're going to have to track. So let's go through for about four seconds. Perfectly fine. And we can say, okay. Let's track for four seconds. That's good enough for us and cool. And so we're going to just move this again. This is a 30 second clip, but I don't need all 30 seconds. I'm just going to grab the four seconds here and say, excellent. We can hit the N key and just hit the letter N and move that to there. And so now we have this track there. Now, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to have a secondary target. So we're going to put something else in this scene. So, for example, let's just do it this way. Let's just take, um, we'll take a clip here. We'll import something in here. And I'm going to go back to workflow. And I'm going to bring in a shot here. Just for fun, we'll bring in a clip of William Shatner in here. Go to William Shatner. We'll pick a photo of William Shatner. And now what William Shatner is here, he looks like there. So what we want to do is we want to put William Shatner right over this New Jersey Transit. So he's just kind of positioned right over this New Jersey Transit. We can make him a little bit smaller, maybe scale him down a little bit and have him right there on this New Jersey Transit. So we're going to go back to this. We're going to go back to this layer. We'll go to the layer. We'll go back to the track point here. And it's going to say tracker. Now what we want to track is the transform controls. We want to track the transform controls. We're not stabilizing in this case. We're not doing anything else. We're just tracking the transform controls and saying, let's edit target. And so under here, under edit target, it says, hey, what do you want to track that goes on top of there? Well, the only layer that we have here is William Shatner. So we're going to track William Shatner onto this layer based on the transform controls for position. We'll say apply. It's going to ask us if we want to apply to the X and Y dimensions. Yep, we want to apply to the X and Y dimensions. And we'll say, okay. 
And then, boom, it'll put William Shatner's anger point right there. And if we even go to opacity, we'll lower this a little bit just so you can see. The anger point is right there in the NJ, and it will maintain right there on the NJ the whole time. Now, this doesn't look perfect. Let's be honest, because we bring this back up and take a look at this. Okay, so let's let's reset William Shatner a little bit. Let's go in here to his transform properties. We'll open up all these, and we'll see. Right now, it's only animating position. So we could say, let's take scale. We'll make scale a little bit smaller so it fits William Shatner right there. We're going to take William Shatner. We're going to rotate him a little bit so he's kind of facing more evenly on the thing and have him situated like that. And just a little bit more scale, maybe up to 50. Excellent, he's right there. And we'll see how he tracks. We'll see how he does. He looks, you know, is he tracked on there? Whoops, sorry. 50%. And we're going to say here, we're going to watch him and he's going to be right there. Now, does he obviously change? Well, a couple things happen here. A couple problems happen. One of the problems is the bus kind of turns around and it gets bigger. So we track just position and it doesn't hit really well. And also there's a problem with a little bit of perspective because the bus is coming at a weird angle. Could we animate this ourselves? Theoretically, yeah. We could take scale and we could say maybe, I don't know, make him 3D and kind of rotate him on the Y axis so he's kind of flatter on the, on the bus, kind of so he's facing this way. And again, we could just rotate him a little bit on the X. So he's there. And we'll animate the Y rotation and the Z rotation here. So we'll animate those. And at the end, we'll see if we can come to here and say he should be this big. And maybe facing a little bit more this way. And he's flatter on the bus. So maybe that looks a little bit more like he's physically on the bus. He actually halfway through loses his scale. The scale might want to be a bigger scale, so it's here, because he actually gets closer than he gets further. So we want to kind of mimic this and get this kind of like that. And there, better or worse, we sort of have him on the bus. He's tracking along on the bus. Again, if you have something like that, you could track along the bus. Now, the other thing we could do is we could say, hey, let's delete this William Shatner. Let's delete this. We'll bring this back in again. We'll bring it back in MVI 7450 here. And we're going to say, let's track again. And we can track motion. And we can track NJ transit. And we can also track in something else and consider rotation and scale. Because obviously, this object gets closer to the bus. And we can say, OK, let's track this to track motion. But simultaneously, we'll track rotation and scale. And again, we have our secondary point. In order to get this motion, we want a secondary point. Maybe we grab in like this corner right here, this little spot right here. We're going to just kind of frame around this right here. We're just going get, to get this spot right here. And we'll get the corner right here. And we're going to track this within this region here. And that will at least allow us to appreciate as this thing rotates and as this thing scales, as the bus comes around, it'll track those things there. I don't know how this is going to work. We're going to try. A lot of times, this is trial and error. We're going to just track and see how this moves. So now you can see that these two points are moving kind of accordingly, and the movement will be more appropriate. As this gets bigger, this also gets bigger. As this rotates, this rotates, and we see we're tracking both the position, rotation, scale. Will this work for William Shatner? I, I don't know. We'll try it with something else here. We'll try it with something, a different idea here. Again, we'll let this go for a couple seconds. And we're just going to say, let's just, let's just instead of putting William Shatner there, which was fun, I understand, we had a good time. Let's just blur the New Jersey Transit out. Say we're just going to do a simple, a simple blur idea. So this is tracking here. We'll let this go for like three seconds. And we'll see how this works. Sometimes this doesn't work the way you want it to. Sometimes it's not great. It's a, it's a, it's a simple tracker. It works relatively well. There's more you can do, but we're going to take this for this three and, three and change. And we're going to track there. We'll hit the end key, move to there. And still we have track there. So let's find something else. We're going to take a uh, command Y, command alt Y, command option Y. Um, we're going to make an adjustment layer. And on this adjustment layer, we're going to put a blur. We're going to go to effects. And we're going to say, let's do a blur and sharpen. We'll do a Gaussian blur. Or maybe we'll even do a stylized, we'll do a stylized mosaic. So this is going to be the mosaic effect 
And this mosaic effect is going to go on top of this like this. We'll change this maybe like 30 by 30. So it's a little bit less there. So it's sort of there, but it's kind of not there. We'll turn this effect off for a second. And I'm just going to say, let's take the pen tool and we'll make a mask over New Jersey Transit like this. So then my mosaic is only over here. Now, the other thing that I may want to do is with this adjustment layer, what I may want to do is I may want to hit the Y key, get the pan behind tool and move the anchor point right to the center there. If I hold down command, it'll snap right to the center. That way I know that it's kind of right in the middle there. So whatever the track point is, it'll be it'll be in there. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say MBI 745. We're going to go back to this layer here and look at these track points here. And here we're going to track tracker one. We're going to use the transform. Edit target is going to be the adjustment layer. Yes. And we're going to say apply. And so we put it on track point one. So it's going to put the anchor point right here on NJ or the NJ transit. We're going to apply. When we apply, it's going to put that blur and sharpen right there. Now, does this look right? I don't know. Let's see. I don't like how much it scales it up. It kind of misaligned how it scaled it up. So I'm going to say, let's get rid of scale. Don't do scale. And we could offset the anchor point. We could also make the mask bigger. We could also go to M for mask and say, let's look at the mask points and say, let's make this mask, you know, larger like this and cover over all of this. A little bit nicer mask and see how this looks here. Maybe feather the mask a little bit. Cool. And just have this. I mean, is that is that you know, intentional that we're, you know, we're clearly hiding something we don't want you to see. Yeah, it looks like an old school 90s hip hop video, right? It looks like that whole, hey, we're blurring something out because we don't want you to know. We're not about labels. Anyway, thing you could do, thing you could do, right? Thing you could do. It works. The other thing we can do, and I'm going to undo a bunch We'll go back here to before this was set up to track. So this isn't set up to track now. We have the track points here. But we haven't applied this to a layer yet. What I may do as an idea, what I may do here is under edit target, it says adjustment layer. We're going to go here and say, okay. But then we're going to go here and we're going to layer menu and layer new null object. And we're going to make a null object. That's going to make in my composition a little red box here. We'll make this yellow just so you can see this a little bit better. This little yellow box here. It's an empty yellow box that does nothing. So now in here, in the tracker, what we're going to do here is we're going to say track this. But instead of tracking the adjustment layer, let's just track the null. Let's edit the target and make the, the target the null object. Why would we do that, Chad? Well, we're going to apply this. I'll show you. X and Y, sure. And we're going to track this object. So now this adjustment layer is not moving. This doesn't have any points onto it. I can do the U key. There's nothing going on here. But the null is the thing that's moving along and following along. So the null is there, but the adjustment layer isn't. Well, now, simply enough, I can parent the adjustment layer to the null. And now the adjustment layer is moving along with. And again, I may want to take it off scale because I don't really want scale to change. And now this is moving along with. And because the adjustment layer is following whatever the null does, now the null becomes this universal tracker point that I can map everything else to. So if I took if I took William Shatner again, and I put William Shatner here and brought in William Shatner and said, let's scale William Shatner down a little bit. And we'll put William Shatner over here in the bus, right? And rotated him a little bit so he's facing this way a little bit there. And then just parented him to the null. Well, guess what? He's going to move with the bus in the same way. And if I duplicated William Shatner and put another William Shatner over here, and another William Shatner duplicate another William Shatner over here. I could have a bunch of William Shatners along the bus, and they would all move with the bus accordingly because they were all following the tracker. Now, it's again, it's imperfect, but you get the idea. It is following along on the tracker, and it is maintaining as it moves. And this is the simple track motion. This is the simple control for track motion. And this is how this works. This idea of using the tracker and doing track motion, it is a thing you can do. However, as a last feature, there is another tracker that exists inside of After Effects, sort of. There's a program out there called Boris Effects. And Boris Effects um, is a 
collection of software that's kind of a competitor for After Effects. It has some cool things. I like After Effects better personally, but you know we're not going to get into that. Um, but we're going to look at there. But Boris FX has a program called Boris Mocha, and Boris Mocha is maybe one of my favorite planar trackers. Now, what do I mean by planar trackers? I mean that this right here, this surface is a plane. It is a plane, you know, it's a piece of board. It's a, it's a flat surface here. And so what we can do is here, we can go into here and we can say, let's grab this and click on this. And there's a control here that says animation menu, track in Boris Effects Mocha. Do you know that Boris Mocha comes with After Effects? Yeah, Mocha has a relationship, Boris has a relationship with After Effects, where they gave a copy of Boris Mocha, one of my favorite trackers in the world, one of my favorite planar trackers in the world, they gave a copy to Adobe, and Adobe uses it with After Effects. Now, this is not a full, robust Boris FX Mocha copy. Um, Boris Mocha is kind of expensive. It is involved. It's there. There's a copy of this called Boris Mocha AE. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, click on this and say, animation menu, track in Boris Mocha. Let's take a look at what Boris Mocha does and how Boris Mocha works. It's going to open up this effects control and say, hey, Mocha E, Mocha. And you might've seen this before here, Boris Mocha AE. It creates this little thing. And in the corner here, it says launch Launch Mocha AE. There's a button right here. This is Launch Mocha AE. Now we're going to launch Mocha AE. It's going to say Mocha is starting. And down here, you're going to see the little pop-up of Mocha starting here. I'm going to start bouncing Mocha there and show me Mocha is loading up. Here it comes. It takes a second or two to load up Mocha AE. But Mocha AE, Mocha AE is a... Man, it's a fantastic program. Now, one of the first things it's going to do is going to tell me about the new features. Yeah, cool. Uh, I don't want to show that next time. Cool. Let's start Boris Mocha. It might ask me to register, but okay. It didn't ask me to register this time, which is nice. Normally, it asks me to register, and I keep forgetting to register because I'm a slacker. But okay, this is Boris Mocha. Now, we're not going to get into crazy amounts of learning about how Boris Mocha works, but we're going to look at Boris Mocha as a program. On a, as a side note, there's a thing you can do. So we can take inside of... We're going to minimize Boris Mocha. We're going to just uh, hide Mocha E for a second. And we're going to go here. And inside of this program here. Um, yeah, there's Mocha E. Cool. Go away, Mocha. Hide Mocha E. Thank you. Um, inside, of, inside of any program. Let's just start over. I'm going to start over here. Um, inside of here. We're just going to quit Mocha. Cool. We're going to go here and we're going to say... Um, if you bring in a, in a video here, so we bring in a video here, uh, one of the things we can do, and this is just a, a separate sequence, one of the things we can do here is we can say, let's take something else. Let's take a, a, an image of something else. Let's just go in here and say, we'll grab in this USA map, and we're going to grab this USA map. One of the things you can do is you can take this USA map, and you said, hey, I want to put this on top of this. We're going to lower the opacity a little bit so you can see. I want to put this on top of this in a way that it makes it fit. So I want to put this in here on top of this in a way that fits. There's an effect in here called Effect Distortion Corner Pin. And Corner Pin allows you to create these pins across the corners of the image. And you can take these pins and you can put a pin like here and take a bottom pin. We'll just make this yellow so you can see these pins. So you go to this corner pin, you'll see these little pins here, and you grab these pins, and you can put a pin here, and you can grab this pin and put this pin here. And it kind of warps the perspective based on how the pins are and where the pins are and makes it look like this is flat against this edge. And depending on how you move these, you can kind of just put this flat on this edge and have this perfectly right on this edge. This is called corner pinning. It's great for putting things in windows. It's great for putting things. So if we want to put it like in this window, we could put the USA map in kind of this window here. If you want to put something in a TV to make it look like something was playing on the TV, you can put it in the TV. But you put these little corner pin points and line them up. And all of a sudden, it looks perfectly like it fits right there in the window. And that is a technique called corner pinning. So let's take a look. Let's go again here. We'll get rid of USA map for a second. And we're going to say, let's go back to this comp here. And we're going to launch Mocha AE. And we're going to launch up Mocha AE. Mocha AE is starting. And we're going to launch Mocha. It's going to bounce for a second. It's going to bring up Mocha AE. So this is the way the Mocha AE works. It's really hard to say. Mocha space AE. 
There's a control here called the X spline, create an X spline. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create an X spline. We're going to draw the area that we want to cover. So we can draw whatever area we want to cover. Let's draw from here. We're going to click here. Just have the pen up, this little X spline pen. We're going to click there. We're going to click to here. We're going to click to here. And I'm actually going to click to this corner right here. If I want to zoom in, I can hold down the Z key and I can hit up arrow and zoom in super close. Or not the up arrow, I can drag up. So you're going to be hold down Z and drag up. And we're going to create a point there. So I have these points there. They have a little bit of roundy edges. Now, I want to complete this. I can make more points if I wanted to. I can make five, six, seven, eight points. I could draw whatever shape I wanted to. Even not a, even just a not even just a, a rectangle. I can draw any kind of shape I want to. But in this case, I want to complete this. So I'm going to right click. The trick is to right click. And that will create my four points. And now I can grab my four points. I can move them. I can adjust them. Have them be exactly where I want them to be. It creates little roundy edges. But you can grab these little points and pull this tighter. I don't know whether rounded edges or sharp point edges are better. I always prefer sharp point edges. So now I have this kind of shape here. And I have this. I'm tracking this, I'm tracking this basically from here to here like this. Now I can bring up this thing here up here called the uh, the planar grid, and the planar grid would show me what it's doing here. Now the planar grid looks weird because let me zoom out, Z drag down, zoom out. It's showing me this as a square that looks square. It's not showing me this on the angle following the bus. And the way to control that is through this thing here called the planar surface. And so here we're turning to the planar grid here. Turn this off, and we're going to turn on the planar surface. And the planar surface looks like this. Let's actually turn the planar grid back on again. We're going to show grid. You'll notice that here, it creates these little points here. I'm going to zoom in again. Sorry, I'm going to zoom in again. And right here, there are these little points right here that I see these little kind of points there. And if I take this and I kind of pull this into a certain shape, kind of like this and like this, and I grab this like this and line this up here and line this up here, I can sort of get this facing on the bus. I'm going to zoom out again, hold down Z, zoom out. And now this is kind of lined up along the bus. All these lines are kind of perfectly aligned the bus. And this looks like it's the plane. The This is the planar grid. The plane is following the bus. So it looks like it's in the position of the bus. This looks like where the bus would be. So this is what it's going to grab. It's going to grab this area here to here. You know, and we can even go a step further. Let's zoom in again just to make sure. I'm going to drag to like here, to this corner, to there, and I'm going to drag to this corner here, just so I can see that this lines up with this line perfectly. And this would line up here. Again, it's going to be a little bit of trial and error just to kind of get this exactly to look right. Z key come back out. We can see that this sort of lines the bus. I think it was better before. Let's bring this point a little bit shorter. I want this to line up here and this to line up like that kind of. Yeah, that feels like it lines up along the bus there. Maybe I'll undo here and I'll go back to where I was before. I feel like what I had before was better. Nope. Okay. Let's go here. Let's go zoom in. A little bit of trial and error, right? A little bit of trial and error. We're going to hang dig, dig this. We're going to put this point up to here. Put this up to here. We're going to take this point. Drag this one to this line, drag this one to this line. Have this situated like here. Whoops, I just I just hit the planar grid again. Let's go back to layer one here, sorry. If you ever click away from this, it, cre it creates a grid that looks like this because you're not on layer one. Let's be on layer one here. And so now this is here. Again, let's zoom out, Z, drag down, and now we have this grid. Yeah, I feel like pretty good about this. I'm looking at this black bar here. It's, it's hitting this black bar here pretty well. I might want to drag this a little bit. Uh, nope, I'm going to undo because I just did something bad. Um, I want to drag these points and just make sure they're lined up really well like that. I feel like that's pretty good. That's in the bus. If you want to test, one of the things you can do is you can look here. It says essentials down here. There's actually different modes of working the screen. So you can work in what's called classic, which gives us a whole bunch of more controls, which is a little crazy and overwhelming of how this works. I personally like essentials because it's really streamlined. You could do a whole course 
on just Mocha AE. But for this, we're just going to do this just this one time. I am by no means a Mocha AE expert. So we're going to leave this here and leave this here doing Mocha AE, doing the job it's doing. And we're going to say, cool, this looks pretty good. We can go in here past essentials. We can go to layer properties and we can look here and say, insert a clip. You can insert a grid that would show you what the grid would look like. We'll turn off the planar grid. And so this is what a grid would look like here. It's kind of okay. We'd also bring in a logo. I really like bringing the logo. Then we can see, okay, this is what the logo would look on here. Now we haven't even begun tracking yet. So let's take this. Let's go here to the planar grid. We'll bring the planar grid back up. We'll bring in no logo. Now we'll go back to essentials. Now down here, you'll see a play button, a play forward, a play backward, a front frame forward, a one frame backward, and a stop button. You'll see all these buttons down here that do all these things. Um, I always get confused because I always want to grab these buttons and hit play. And that will just play this for you. It won't do anything for you. Over here is the track buttons. So now we're going to track forward. And here we're going to say track forward. And we'll let this track. And this will start to track. And you're going to watch this. This will start to, excuse me, start to track layer one forward. And it'll start to go and track forward. It actually works pretty quickly. It's going frame 12, 15, 16, 18, 20, whatever it's doing. It's doing all these frames up in here. And it's tracking forward all these frames. We're going to let this go for what? 120 frames maybe? If something went wrong, you could stop your track and you could readjust your positions and see, oh, yeah, my track didn't work out really well. It started to lose. I felt like it started to lose focus around here and it wasn't maintaining there. You could grab the points again and say, update the track and hit the track there. And you can make keyframes if you want to and retrack and re reset your position there with new keyframes. We'll go back here. We'll go back to here. Say, let's track forward again. We're going to track forward this and watch how this looks. Make sure this seems like it's on the surface of there. Again, you can make keyframes if you want to. Now, one of the things I actually want to do, I'm going to stop this again. I think for this one, I think what's going to be important is to track this. I didn't mention this before. We're going to track this here. Just like that. This is on here. It's on the surface. The layer looks like a good logo. Looks like it fits there. Fantastic. Excellent. Cool. We're going to track this, but we're also going to track perspective. Right now, it's track, tracking translation, scale, rotation, skew. We're going to track perspective as well. I think I want to track all these things. I want to just make sure I'm getting the best track possible. We'll track forward and watch this thing as it tracks forward. And it looks like it's holding on. The mocha, I mean, it looks like it. the mocha would belongs there, right? It's doing a pretty good tracker. This is for tracking plain surfaces here. So making it look like it fits on there on a plain surface. There we go. We're going to track forward. And the Mocha is fitting on there pretty well, pretty well, pretty beautifully. I think I'm pretty happy with how this is tracking. It's doing a pretty decent job. Again, I'm only going to go to 20, 120 frames. We're going to do five seconds. Afterwards, the bus kind of stops and waits for traffic. I don't think I need to track more than that. We're going to stop this and say, cool, we've stopped, we've tracked. So we've tracked this first five seconds and almost six seconds, almost six seconds. Now, we're going to save this. So if we close out of here, it's going to ask if we want to save, but we're going to hit uh, File Save, Command S, Save, um, and we're going to close this out. And now we close this out. It says Mocha's there. And now it, over here, it says Tracking Data. It also asks about the mat. We can actually add a mat in here if we wanted to, but for now, we want to look at Tracking Data. We're going to Create Tracking Data. So when we say Create Tracking Data, we're going to Create Tracking Data. It's going to put in all this tracking data in here. It asks us what layer we want to use for the tracking data. What do we want to use for the tracking data, Chad? Well, what we want to use is layer one. That was the track that we had before. Remember, we clicked on layer one, and it showed us the tracking data for layer one. Here's the thing. See this little uh, little sprocket over here? So you can turn this off. Don't ever turn this off. I don't know why this exists to say, no, I don't want the tracking data from layer one. I don't know why you have that option there. I had a student turn this off one time. It took me like a day to figure out what the heck they were doing wrong. They had turned this off. Leave that sucker on. We're going to say okay and drag the tracking data. And now it created all this tracking data on this layer. So all this layer, here's the top right, the top left, the bottom right, the bottom left, the center, the rotation, the scale, all this stuff, all this tracking data is in here. Man, look at all this tracking data. It created all this tracking data inside of here. Great. And you can see these little pins right here. These little pins, these are like the corner pins. These are perfectly right there lined up. So now we want to take these corner pins and we want to apply them to a layer. So let's take a layer here. 
let's go into our project window and I'm going to take in this picture of Cinderella. So we have this picture of Cinderella. It's a little bit smaller. It's only 1280 by 720. It's this scene from Disney Cinderella. No, kind of, I'm not marketing Cinderella or anything, but we'll use this example. Now, here's the trick. We can go in here into the effects controls and we can say effects controls for here. And we can choose the layer we want to go to is Cinderella. And it's going to put the track on Cinderella and we'll say apply and we'll do this there. But we don't want to do this right now. Here's why. Because Cinderella is not as big as the screen. This image of Cinderella is not screen size. And if we try to scale this up and make this screen size, it's not going to give us what we want. Because it's going to, it's going to, it's the track is weird. It doesn't like it if we scale this up to 150% and make this bigger. It's not our friend. It's not what we want to do. It's not how we want to work this. I'm going to reset the position here. There, so it's centered. Here's what I want to do. I can scale this up, but what I want to do is I want to pre-compose this. Uh, this is the trick for using Boris Mocha. Uh, I had to figure this out. We're going to go to Command Shift C, uh, and we're going to pre-compose this and put this into a layer. Move all the attributes into the comp, and now the real size is this big, and now it's screen size. So now here, T key, this is just one thing. It's not been scaled up because the scaling up has happened inside the comp. This is here. This is this size. So now we're going to back to this. We'll go back to apply this to Cinderella comp, which is the screen says there. We're going to hit apply, export, and then boom, it's going to put Cinderella right onto there. And then boom, Cinderella is perfectly right there. And you'll see that we did a bunch of controls here for Cinderella here. And we've applied the corner pinning to Cinderella. Now, if Cinderella wasn't right here, we could now, after the fact, take this and this is moving along here. We could offset the anchor point maybe. Did the anchor point move the anchor point here just so it's maybe this way, shift it a little bit, fit it right there. And this should, based on common principles, hold that, hold that track pretty much there along the path pretty well. So we'll play that, let that play, and then boom, your track is right there holding Cinderella right there. We could maybe go into blending mode. So we could take the blending mode and say, maybe change this so it looks like it's, I don't know, like overlay or something. So it looks like it's there. Maybe not like that. Maybe let's see, let's see shift plus, go different blending modes. Maybe, you know, have it more fit like it fits in there. I don't know, something, maybe not. We could do something, we could color correct it at least. Yeah, we'll stick with normal, we'll stick with normal. But we could color correct this a little bit so that it looks like it fits there a little bit better. You know, take some of the contrast out of this. Effects, uh, color correction, curves. Pull some high-end contrast out of Cinderella so it makes it fit like it fits there a little bit. Take some of the saturation out maybe. Some of the blue down. Some of the darker blue down. Something uh, we could color cook with this a little bit so it fits and a little bit better. It looks a little bit sharper. It looks a little bit like more like it's there. But now it's Cinderella on the on the on the thing. This is a planar tracker. So this is a planar tracker. Mocha, Mocha is your friend. Mocha can do some really fun stuff, really nice, interesting stuff. Play with it, explore it. In a future lesson, we're going to start talking about uh, camera trackers and we'll start looking at some of those things both in After Effects and maybe in Cinema 4D as well. Uh, I think this is some cool stuff. So these four functions or these functions of using stabilized motion, warp stabilizer, track motion, and then also in the animation menu, track and Boris Mocha. Again, if you want to get a full version of Boris Mocha, feel free to spend the money. Go get Boris Mocha. It's great. It's a lot, but it's great. Uh, you can do some amazing tracking. But tracking, you know, for putting things into scenes... You know, adding visual effects, adding explosions, adding 3D characters, adding animated characters into scenes, adding different things, gunshots, muzzle flash, whatever it may be. Yeah, it's adding fire. So in, in scenes that are moving, you're going to want to track. So it is kind of a fundamental thing that we should cover. I think we did a decent job today. So play along, have some fun, and we'll come back in a future lesson.